Hi, we're the Luke Keys. I'm Pear. I'm Carolyn. I'm Kate. And I'm Stefan. And we are longtime parishioners and wanted to welcome you to today's service. Whether you are like us, longtime parishioners, or a first time visitor, we are happy to have you here. More information can be found on our website, stpaulberlingame.org, and we encourage you to look there for more information. And today is a special day. We welcome you on the day that we're saying goodbye and thank you to Reverend Julie Graham, who's served this congregation so well for so long. So join us in sending our love and thanks to Reverend Julie and wishing her all the best in her new adventures in St. Louis. Julie, without your warm, enthusiastic presence, the Christmas pageant will never be the same. Thank you so much, Reverend Julie, and please enjoy your service. Alleluia, Christ is risen. God be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whom truly to know is everlasting life, grant us so perfectly to know your Son, Jesus Christ, to be the way, the truth, the life and love that we may steadfastly follow in his steps who leads to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit one God forever and ever amen a reading from the first letter of John beloved let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. 
If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his Spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters, are liars. For those who do not love a brother or a sister whom they have seen, cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, those who love God, must love their brothers and sisters also. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. A reading from the Gospel according to John. Jesus said to his disciples, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. 
Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Please join me in prayer. Gracious and loving God, help us this day to understand and celebrate your dream for the world, to be transformed in Jesus' love, and to use our gifts to make a difference for others. Amen. People have a lot of different ways of talking about God. Philosophers might talk about the, the power at the beginning of the cosmos the prime mover of all that is, the, the ground of being. Religious people are a little nervous about trying to describe God. Nervous about using words or images that might at once somehow describe God, but at the same time try to draw a box around the infinite and mysterious God. In the Jewish tradition, there is a prohibition against using God's name. In the Muslim tradition, images of God or the prophet are not allowed. All so that we might avoid the idolatry that comes when we think we can squeeze God into a particular image or form. And yet, we have to talk about God in some way. Jesus uses parables in which God is compared to the Father, or the righteous judge, or like last week, the Good Shepherd. The Jewish people tell the great stories of how God acted in history, as do Christians. Sometimes we talk about God just using the poetry of prayer. Theologian Sally McFaig talks about all these different ways of trying to talk about God as metaphors. She defines a metaphor as a word or an image that points to a greater reality, that, that even, bef even beyond that may actually contain the grace of the greater reality, in this case God, but as a metaphor, we also know that it's not really that thing, that, that thing it's pointing to, like the, the Buddhist story of the finger pointing to the moon. You know, don't look at the finger, look at the moon. Look at what it's pointing at. If we're talking about God, she talks about metaphors about God in a similar way. She says, we can talk about God and get these qualities. In that sense, a metaphor is what God's like but a metaphor always has a little component that also helps us realize that God is also not exactly that. It's inexact on purpose as a metaphor. A metaphor is both what something is and what something is not at the same time. So Sally McFaig's concern is, what do we mean when we talk about God as Father or Creator or Redeemer? How do we see these multiple metaphors as ways to talk about God and who God is, recognizing that none of them is complete, none of them captures who God really is, but we use them to, to dance around the mystery of the living God. Always maintaining a healthy agnosticism hedging our bets, a respect for the mystery of God, recognizing that we're not trying to say too much. It's just a metaphor, we say. These past few weeks, we've been following along in the first letter of John. And John's teaching 
that love is at the center of Christian life. The first week we talked about how he equated life, that's his end point, his life, with love. And we connected it to our current Episcopal way of talking about the way of love. And then the next week, John reminded us that we are loved. That the wonder of God is that God loved us first. He calls his followers and his readers, you and me, beloved. And so that first, that first lesson of love is that we are loved. And the question we ask is, can we trust that we're loved? And then last week, using the metaphor of the good shepherd, we were reminded that love was not just a word. Love required sacrifice. That Jesus laid down his life for his friends. And so we too, not just, not just to be sheep, but, but to be that same kind of shepherd that lays down our lives for one another. Because that's, <clears throat> that's what it means to act out of love. And we might think, after all these days of talking about, ways of talking about love, that love is another metaphor for God. But John goes further. John doesn't simply say that God loves, or that love is one way to think about God. John gives God a name. So a little bit heretical to start with. John says, God is love. Not just God is like love. Not just that God loves the world. God is love. In the 14th century, in the midst of another time of plague, Julian of Norwich fell deeply ill. And in the midst of her illness, when she was near death, Christ revealed himself to her. And Julian of Norwich spent the rest of her life trying to describe in words what that revelation was like she moved to a little cell attached to a church in Norwich and there she prayed and she studied and she counseled people and she wrote and she wrote about the, the revelation of Christ to her the book was called revelations of divine love it was the first book written by a woman in the English language And what did Julian see? She saw that God was pure love. In a time in the medieval imagination, when people were focused on punishment and judgment, think about Dante's Inferno, Julian dared to say that there is no judgment in God. Only divine love. When Julian says, shares her most famous line, you've probably seen it in calligraphy on posters and heard it preached on before, she is preaching directly against the metaphor of judgment. She says, because of the tender love of our good Lord, which he has for all of us who shall be saved, he gives comfort readily and sweetly, assuringly. It is true that sin is the cause of all pain, he says, but all shall be well. All shall be well. And all manner of things shall be well. These words are said most tenderly, she says showing no kind of blame assigned to me or to anyone who shall be saved. Consequently, it would be most unnatural for me to 
to blame or wonder at God on any account of my sin, seeing that God does not blame me. Perhaps this is what John is talking about in the letter today when he says, perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love casts out fear of judgment or pain or suffering. Perfect love casts out fear. What would it mean for the world? What would it mean for you and for me if love was truly at the center? If the very energy at the beginning of the cosmos was best described as love. That God is not just described as love as some kind of metaphor, but God is love. What would it mean for you and for me to be a receiver of God's love as one whom God is not blaming? What would it mean when shame and regret that creep into your soul and seek to drag you down were simply wiped away because God is love? What would it mean when others try to criticize you or judge or blame? What would it mean to know that at the beginning and at the end that you are loved? That in Christ and in the Holy Spirit, the power of love provides armor and healing against the power of shame. What would it mean to have love as the single guiding North Star? What would it mean to have love as the single thing that undergirds your calling in this world? Love at the center of every act. Love for family. Love for the lost. Love for generations that are yet to come that moves us to care for this fragile, gentle gift of love we know as Mother Earth. What if love is not some discreet little part of life, but is the energy that flows through everything from the Big Bang to the end of creation, from birth all the way to death. From the time you wake up till the time you go to bed. What would it mean for love to counter that tendency that when we're feeling pain, to try to place blame on some usually vulnerable other person. But instead, we turn to love through and through. What would it mean for love to be the actual energy of life? Not judgment, not criticism of others or criticism of self, not comfort, but love. What would it mean to try that on? Maybe just for a day or for a week as a way to practice. In conversations that go on as you're in your head as you begin the day and imagine what it's going to be like and live through that day. What would it mean for you to order your life completely grounded 
around love. How would that look as you're sending your child off to school for the day? Or when you're going into the next business meeting for the day? Or when you're making dinner for yourself or for those around you who you love? Or when you're making sandwiches for people you don't even know? What would it mean about the way that you structure your day and each moment. What if at at the top of your calendar for the day, it simply said love? And in your prayers at the end of the day, the last word of the day was love. And whenever something tried to hijack you away, whenever judgment or shame tried to hijack your chosen agenda of love, you were able to return to the simple truth that it's all about love. No more wrestling with multiple metaphors, but simply resting in the real thing. God is love.
prayers of the people. I answer prayers for God's people throughout the world, for our Bishop Mark, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. We pray this day for the good stewardship of our buildings, that they may provide a place of prayer, learning, service, and fellowship. We give thanks for the stewards of our buildings team who are preserving and preparing our campus for a joyous return, even as we are still away. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace in our nation and for the well-being of all people. We pray especially for those who continue to be victims of gun violence at the hands of others and for those who die by suicide. We pray for those who are the victims of racism and prejudice. Pray for peace and pray justice. For Pray for peace and justice. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. For those who continue to suffer from COVID-19, for those who are ending, en enduring painful treatments for their illnesses. We pray for those afflicted by isolation and loneliness. Pray for those in need or trouble. We give thanks for everyone who is celebrating a birthday this week. For Holland, for Caroline, for Dean, and Patrick, Lena, Reed, Blake, Holly, Grace, Ron, Melina, and Yuki. We give special thanks to uh, Ron and Edith who are celebrating their anniversary. And in particular this weekend, we would like to say special prayers for Charles Vaughn, Jim Hansen, Bonnie Merrick, Christopher, Joan Verlingo, Linda McLaughlin, Diane Miller, the Forrest family, Michelle Sloat, Susan Lawson, Billy Young, Banafshe, Laura Cope, John and Arlene Borgeson, Nate Price, Michelle Blair, Nan Casulos, Tom Bryce, Renee and Bern Kemi, Wally Clevisal, Jim Prescott, the Murdoch family, especially Charlotte. I ask your prayers for the Departed. Pray for those who have died. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, in heaven allowed by thy name, thy name, the kingdom come, thy will, will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven. Give, Give us the day our daily, daily bread. bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As most of you know, this is my last full official Sunday with you, St. Paul's community. I can't believe it, but here it is. God has called me to a new place and is calling you to a new place with new clergy. This has been a growing, enriching, amazing journey with you all these years through pageants and pancake suppers and Advent festivals and building houses in Mexico, this has been life-changing. And you will go forward emerging out of this pandemic, changing lives as you always have. You are making a difference. You've made a difference in my life and in my family's.
God bless you and thank you for letting me be in this place with you following Jesus. And now may the love which fills our souls send you out into the world to love the whole creation and to know God's love for you. And the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you this day and always. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia. Go in peace. Go in love to serve the living God.